Money Lending, Its History and Philosophy by Dr. Yaron Brook. Throughout history, they've been called evil, blood-sucking, money-grubbing parasites. <laughs> Authorities in the Middle Ages damned them as spiders, toads, and all creatures diabolical. Medieval artists saw them dragged down to hell by the bag of money around their neck. Their actions were sinful according to the Catholics and, I quote, a great huge monster like a werewolf to Martin Luther. In the 20th century, both left-wing environmentalists and the Christian right hate them. The writer Ezra Pound described their work as, quote, the core of evil, the burning hell without let up, end quote. Shakespeare, Dickens, Dostoevsky, modern literature and popular novels depicted them as villains. They are condemned as useless, overpaid, paper-shuffling parasites. These are the usurers of the Middle Ages, the bankers of the 19th century, and today's Wall Street financiers. They are the people who make money from money, the money lenders. Their activity has been condemned by almost every thinker in history, even those who disagree on almost every other issue. Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, Adam Smith, Marx, Keynes, the good guys as well as the bad guys. In spite of all this, moneylenders have worked to make commerce and industry possible since money was first used. They funded the first trade between the Christians in Europe and the Saracens of the East. They backed the new merchants of Italy and later Holland and England. They supported Spain's exploration of the New World and funded gold and silver mining operations. Without them, the successful colonization of America would have been impossible. And most important, they fueled the Industrial Revolution by supplying the necessary capital to new entrepreneurs in England, the US, and Europe. They made possible the steel, railroad, automobile, and every other industry. In the late 20th century, they provided billions of dollars to finance the computer, telecommunications, and biotech industries. Without the financiers, without their markets and institutions, none of our material wealth would exist. So the question we're asking today is, given their enormous contribution to human well-being, why have they been so mistreated? Why do they continue to be mistreated? My goal is to explain the universal hostility towards one of humanity's greatest benefactors, the moneylenders, and what is required to replace this hostility with the gratitude that is the moneylenders right. You will also learn the paradoxical role played by Aristotle in the moneylenders reputation, how his own argument against moneylending which was adopted by centuries of scholastic thinkers, was destroyed by his own methodology. Money lending is the root of all finance. It is the most elementary financial transaction in which person A lends person B X dollars for a fixed period of time and requires that the money be returned with interest. This practice of making money for money has been vilified for thousands of years. Today's lecture, however, is not on finance or economics. We will be discussing philosophy and history primarily. I will examine the changing views of money lending by philosophers and economists and the culture in general against the background of a history spanning more than 1,000 years. I'm assuming a certain context of knowledge, that you know something of the history of the West and you are familiar with the general philosophical attitudes of different historical eras. I am also, also assuming that you know, at least at some level, that money lending is a productive and economically valuable activity. Proving this is beyond the scope of this current talk. However, a thorough economic defense and explanation of the productivity of finance already exists in the writing of the Austrian economists and in my course in defense of financial markets available at the Ayn Rand bookstore. Money lenders throughout history have been called usurers, a term that connotes wickedness. However, usury according to the Oxford English Dictionary is, and I quote, 
a premium on money given on loan, or the fact or practice of lending money at interest, end quote. It is what we consider today as taking interest. It is only in modern usage that, we, that it means, quote, the practice of charging, taking, or contracting to receive excessive or illegal rates of interest for, loan, for money on loan. We shall see how the, how the concept of usury evolved. I will use the term usury primarily in its original sense, as synonymous with lending money at interest. While, now, while Greek and Roman culture was somewhat hostile to usury, I think the modern hostility has its roots in Christianity. Thus, let us start the historical journey with the Dark Ages, a time when the church ruled men's lives. William Manchester describes the Dark Ages as, quote, stark in every dimension, famines and plagues culminating in the Black Death and its recurring pandemics repeatedly thinned the population. Among the lost arts were bricklaying. In all of Germany, England, Holland, and Scandinavia, virtually no stone buildings except cathedrals were raised for 10 centuries. Peasants labored harder, sweated more, and collapsed ex from exhaustion more often than their animals. Now, in this world, the concept of an economy had little meaning. Human society had reverted to a primitive, pre-civilized state, and barter was the only means of trade. For centuries, money disappeared from European commerce. Now, some trade did exist, as did some lending. But loans were made with goods, and the interest was charged with goods. These loans enabled people to survive the tough times inevitable in an agrarian society. Yet the church violently opposed this mild level of life-sustaining lending. During this period, the Bible was considered the fount of all knowledge. For every question, every problem, scholars consulted the Bible for answers. And the Bible clearly opposed usury, lending money or goods at interest. The prohibition against usury has its roots in the Old Testament. God says to the Jews, Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother, usury of money, usury of victuals. And later it says, Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury. In other words, Jews could not engage in usury with other Jews, but were allowed to make loans at interest to non-Jews. Although the New Testament does not condemn usury explicitly, it makes clear that one's moral duty is to help those in need. Thus, to give them money or goods without the expectation of anything in return, neither interest nor principal. As Luke states, quote, lend hoping for nothing again. Jesus' expulsion of the money changes from the temple is merely a dramatic parable of the evil of profit and of profit generated by, generated by loaning money in particular. Christianity opposed usury from its beginnings and reinforced its moral objections with legal restrictions. In 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea banned the practice among clerics. Under Charlemagne, the, the church extended the prohibition to everyone, defining usury simply as a transaction that, quote, where more, where more is asked than is given. In 1139, the Second Lateran Council in Rome denounced usury as a form of theft and required restitution from those who practiced the sinful act. In the 12th and 13th centuries, strategies that concealed usury were also condemned the Council of Vienna in 1311 declared that any person who dared claim that there was no sin in the practice of usury should be punished as a heretic. Now the Bible's double standard allowed Jews to lend to Christians, since Jews did not see Christians as their brothers. For lengthy periods during the Middle Ages, both church and civil authorities allowed Jews to practice usury. Many princes who required substantial loans in order to pay bills and wage wars, allowed Jewish usurers in their states. They rationalized this by reference to the fact that the Bible did not prohibit Jews from engaging in usury. 
Europe's Jews, who were already barred from most professions and from ownership of land, found money lending a profitable, if hazardous, profession. Now, I have a lot more to say about Jews and money lending uh, during the Middle Ages and, and why I think it's at the roots, well, one of the causes of anti-Semitism in Europe. But please ask me about that in the Q&A if you're interested. From the outset, there were clearly problems with the biblical interpretation. How could it be that Jews were prohibited from lending to other Jews, but were allowed to lend to strangers? St. Jerome's solution was that it was wrong to charge interest to one's brother. And to Christians, all other Christians were brothers. But it was fine to take usury from one's enemy. Usury was perceived as a weapon that weakened the borrower and strengthened the lender. So if one loaned money at interest to one's enemy, that enemy would suffer. Now this actually led Christians to the absurd practice of lending money to the Saracens, their enemies, during the Crusades. <laughs> now Christian thinkers viewed economic life as a zero-sum game. That is, every winner entailed a loser. The lender seemed to grow richer without effort at the expense of the borrower who became poorer. As one contemporary English theologian wrote, the usurer wants to make a profit without doing any work, even while he is sleeping. Unsurprisingly, usurers suffered for their profession. Preachers used their sermons to vilify the usurer, who became the universal symbol for evil. Stories describing their horrible deaths and horrific existence in hell were common. In one sermon, a prominent French bishop argued, God created three types of men, peasants and other laborers to assure the subsistence of others, knights to defend them and clerics to govern them. But the devil created a fourth group, the usurers. They do not participate in men's labors and they will not be punished with men but with the demons. For the amount of money they receive from usury corresponds to the amount of wood sent to hell to burn them. Usurers were evil, said the church, because their profits were obviously selfish. Since they became rich without appearing to do any work, they were considered unproductive. Since the lender's gain was the borrower's loss and the borrower was often poor, they were considered exploitative or unchristian. But the fundamental con condemnation of usury during this early period was dogmatic. The Bible said it, and everyone accepted it. Morality from medieval thinkers had little connection with productivity or reality, only with scripture. Now, even if the thinkers at the time cared about the productivity of money lending, there was little economic activity su to suggest that usury had any practical value. This is one period in history where it would be impossible to observe the merits of usury, and very easy to believe that its main function was exploitation. After all, this is a world in which, according to William Manchester, and I quote, abduction for ransom was an acceptable means of livelihood for skilled but landless knights, where the level of violent, everyday violence, deaths in alehouse brawls, bouts with staves, or even playing football or wrestling, was shocking. Thus, the church's view that usury was evil incarnate, even though based on biblical authority, would have been difficult to dispute. Now, the 11th century brought significant changes. Through trade with the Far East and exposure to the flourishing uh, cultures and economies of North Africa and the Middle East, economic activity increased throughout Europe. This activity created a greater demand for capital for credit, moneylenders arose throughout Europe to fill the need. Between the 11th and 13th centuries, Europe, Europeans imported many goods from the south and east. But more important, they imported knowledge. The Arabic numerical system, double entry bookkeeping, mathematics, science. Most importantly, they discovered the works of Aristotle. Aristotle's work soon became the focus of attention in all of Europe's learning centers, and his writings 
had a profound effect on the scholars of the time. No longer were biblical references enough for the young intellectuals. They had discovered reason, and they required that their ideas be grounded in it. While they were still handcuffed by their Christianity, and therefore spent most of their time trying to rationalize Christian doctrine, their acceptance of reason and their efforts to incorporate it were truly heroic. Like earlier Christian scholars, but for far different reasons, Aristotle believed that usury was unjust. In his first book of politics, he writes, The most hated sort of money-making, and with the greatest reason, is usury, which makes a gain out of money itself, and not from the natural use of it. For money was intended to be used in exchange, but not to increase at interest. And this term usury, which means the birth of money from money, is applied to the breeding of money, because the offspring resembles the parent. Wherefore, of all modes of making money, this is the most unnatural." End quote. Aristotle shared the Christian view that economic activity was a zero-sum game. He believed that charging interest was immoral because money is not reproductive. Here is his argument. If you allow someone to use your orchard, the orchard bears fruit every year. It's productive. From this fruit, he can pay you rent. But money is merely a medium of exchange. When you loan someone money, they receive no value from the money itself. The money does not create more money. It's barren. So an exchange of $100 for $100 plus $10 in interest is unjust, since you receive more than you gave, and what you gave could not have brought about the 10% increase. Making money from money is therefore unnatural, because money cannot multiply itself or bring about the multiplication of an orchard. The platonic remnant in Aristotle led him to believe that every good has some intrinsic absolute value, that $100 was worth $100 and could be worth only $100. He either did not consider or rejected the idea that money loses value over time as its use to the lender is postponed, or that money could be invested in other economic activity to create wealth. For Aristotle, money could not itself yield anything extra. The lender's gain could not come from any attribute unique to money. So it had to come from defrauding the borrower, in other words, by abuse and injustice. Now, for Aristotle, the reason usury was immoral lay in reality, in the fact, as he perceived it, that it did not seem to improve human life, that it was not productive. For the next 400 years, the theologians and lawyers struggled with Aristotle's idea, producing several rationalistic arguments against usury. To begin with, they updated Aristotle's argument for the barrenness of money confirming that the usurer was an unnatural parasite. As one of them put it, quote, Usurers sin against nature by wanting to make money give birth to money as a horse gives, gives birth to a horse. They also argued that usury generated an unnatural separation between ownership and use of a good, claiming that usury was like asking two prices for wine, one price for the wine and one for drinking it. And similarly, the usury generated profit for the lender from goods that didn't belong to him, those goods owned by the borrower. As one scholastic put it, he who gets fruit from that money, whether it be pieces of money or anything else, gets it from a thing which does not belong to him, and it is accordingly all the same as if he were to steal it. Now, the most economically significant scholastic observation about usury came from Thomas Aquinas, who observed that interest is the, is the price asked for time. Usurers seek a pretext to make the prohibi prohibited business appear fair by claiming compensation for time. That is, uh, that is their intention, said Aquinas, sorry, that this is their intention, said Aquinas, is evident from the fact that they change their interest rates according to the duration of the loan. However, the medievals believed that time was a common good. It belonged to no one in particular, but was a gift from God. 
Thus they believed that users wanted to defraud God. <laughs> Contemporary prohibitions even condemned the fact that usury did not stop working on the Sabbath. Interest was still working. <laughs> which was God's day. Hi, I'm the helpful Southern California Honda person, and recently we've been doing random acts of helpfulness, like surprising a deserving dad with a brand new grill, and helping give back to our veterans. And during the Honda Summer Spectacular event, we can help you too, with a great deal on a reliable award-winning Honda, like the Accord, the 2018 North American Car of the Year. Click the dealer locator link to find a dealer near you, and go to SoCalHondaDealers.com to suggest a random act of helpfulness for someone you know. Hi, I'm the helpful Southern California Honda person, and recently we've been doing random acts of helpfulness, like surprising a deserving dad with a brand new grill, and helping give back to our veterans. And during the Honda Summer Spectacular event, we can help you too, with a great deal on a reliable award-winning Honda, like the Accord, the 2018 North American Car of the Year. Click the dealer locator link to find a dealer near you, and go to SoCalHondaDealers.com to suggest a random act of helpfulness for someone you know. Now, while the idea that an individual's own their own time was centuries away, Aquinas' ide identification of the value of time and its relationship to interest was original and valid. Indeed, interest is compensation for a delay in using one's own funds. It is compensation for the user's time. Aquinas' error would later be corrected by his greater legacy, his reintroduction of a self-correcting method, reason. While the scholastics came to similar conclusions as those reached by earlier Christian thinkers, they now defended their views by reference to the perceived economic reality created by usury. The biblical references were now only part of their argument against usury. The issue of its economic worth, its productivity, became their central concern. Thus the discussion turned away from scripture to reality. The question became, is money barren? Does usury have a productive function? Now this is Aristotle's great achievement. Aristotle, through Aquinas, turned the human mind back to reality, away from faith and away from scripture. It would take hundreds of years for this to develop fully, but the type of arguments made during the late Middle Ages show the beginnings of a revolution. As time passed, these scholastic arguments had to contend with a profound adversary, a new economic reality. The economic expansion and growth in trade that occurred in southern Europe starting in the 12th century required capital. Thus, usurers were plentiful. They were often Jews, but just as often they were Lombards, Tuscans, and others. Moneylenders made it possible for the church to finance the Crusades. They allowed kings to wage wars, and merchants to trade across vast distances. While the merchant credit they extended was technically usury, they were selectively allowed to continue their activities but by both papal and civic authorities. They were too valuable to be shut down completely. Thus, the church implicitly condoned a moral practical dichotomy. While it was immoral, usury was necessary and therefore allowed selectively. Indeed, while the church claimed that justice was its main concern in prohibiting usury, its behavior suggests otherwise. Church officials, particularly from the 12th century on, frequently manipulated the usury doctrine and its enforcement to bolster the financial power of the church. When it wanted to keep its own borrowing cost low, the church enforced the usury prohibition. At other times, the church readily loaned money for interest, Monks were among the earliest moneylenders, offering carefully disguised mortgages throughout the Middle Ages. The church itself was often a lender. Vatican documents revealed that they engaged in hard-nosed treatment of delinquent borrowers. They were often threatened with excommunication if they did not repay the loans on time. Church officials looked the other way to usury of a favored transgressor, the Florentine banks, for example, the Medicis, since the church was a regular borrower, while continuing to condemn usury. 
Now, to facilitate the church's selective opposition to usury, religious and civil authorities created many loopholes in the prohibition to avoid the stigma associated with usury. Azuliot's 12.20, a new term was coined to replace certain forms of usury. The concept was of interest. The modern word interest derives from the Latin verb interio, which means to be lost. Note that interest was considered to be a loss, not a profit, which is totally consistent with the church's zero-sum economics and altruism. Compensation for a loan was illegal if it was a gain or profit. But if it was reimbursement for loss or expense, it was permissible. Thus, interest was considered compensation due to a creditor because of a loss which he had incurred through lending. It was, in a sense, damages, not profit. Therefore, interest was allowed sometimes, while usury never. So, some money lenders were allowed to charge interest as a penalty for delayed repayment of a loan, provided that the lender preferred repayment to the delay plus interest. That is, provided that it was a sacrifice. Loans were often structured in advance so that such delays were anticipated and priced, and the prohibition on usury was avoided. Many known money lenders and bank bankers like the Benj Belgian Lombards, derived their profits from such penalties. Over time, the view of costs or damages for the lender was expanded. The lender's time and effort in making the loan could be a reason for charging interest. A far looser interpretation allowed for interest to be charged if the lender could show an obvious, profitable alternative use for the money. If by lending he suffered from the inability to make a profit elsewhere, the interest was allowed as compensation for the potential loss. Indeed, according to some sources, even risk, economic risk, was viewed as, a worthy, as worthy compensation. Therefore, if there was a risk that the debtor would not pay, interest charged in advance was permissible. Now, this is a major breakthrough. The legitimization for advance recognition of a venture's risk and for compensation and advance for this risk was a giant leap. The recognition of the idea of certainty and uncertainty in planning and in economic calculations is evidence of the influence of Aristotle's epistemology in the period following the 13th century. While economic activity continued to grow during the, latter, the late Middle Ages, and the prohibition on usury was evaded or even ignored, the people of the time suffered greatly. Usurers were forced to pay restitution and driven to poverty. They were often excommunicated. In the case of Jews, they were often violently attacked and murdered. It was, as they say, a high-risk profession. Spiritually, moneylenders were constantly under attack. They were the devil's henchmen and were sure to go to hell. It was common to hear stories of usurers going mad in old age out of fear of what awaited. Remember, people took their faith very seriously. They truly believed in hell. The Italian poet Dante, for example, placed them in the seventh rung of hell, incorporating the tradition, traditional medieval punishment for usury, which was eternity with a heavy bag of money around one's neck. Usurers in Dante's hell are forever weighted down by their greed. Prophets believe Dante should be the fruits of labor, and usury entailed no actual work. He believed that the deliberate intellectual choice in such an unnatural action as usury was the worst kind of sin. It is a wonder that anyone, let alone so many, defied the law in their faith to practice money lending. In that sense, the usurers were truly heroic. By defying their religion and placing themselves in danger, they made their material lives better. They made money. And by doing so, they made possible economic growth for the first time in hundreds of years. It was thanks to a series of loans, for example, from local money lenders, that Gutenberg was able to make his printing press 
commercial. The early bankers made possible advances in commerce and industry that would grow into the economy of the Renaissance and later the Industrial Revolution. By the end of the Middle Ages, though everyone condemned usury, few could deny its practical use. Thus, the Middle Ages established a split that exists to this day between what is proper and moral and what is practical and economically necessary. Usury was tolerated as necessary for economic advancement and for the enrichment of the powers to be, church and prince, but morally condemned. Economics and morality were split. In the following centuries, man increased his understanding of the productivity of usury, but added virtually nothing to its moral evaluation. The start of the 16th century brought about a commercial boom in Europe. It was the golden age of exploration. Trade routes opened to the New World and expanded to the East, bringing unprecedented trade and wealth to Europe. To fund this trade, to supply credit for commerce and the beginnings of industry, banks were established throughout Europe. For example, Genoese and German banks funded Spanish and Portuguese exploration and importation of New World gold and silver. Part of what made this financial activity possible was the new and necessary tolerance in some cities towards usury. The Italian city of Genoa, for example, had a very relaxed attitude towards usury, and moneylenders created many ways to circumvent the existing prohibitions. It was clear to the city's leaders that the financial activities of its merchants were crucial for Genoa's prosperity. However, the leaders on principle tolerance could not last, and at the first economic downturn, the city's financiers were attacked. Although the Catholic Church's official view towards usury remained unchanged until the 19th century, the Reformation, which occurred principally in North Europe, brought about a mild acceptance of usury. This could indeed be one reason. Southern Europe, which was heavily Catholic, lagged the rest of Europe economically from the 17th century onwards. Now Martin Luther, a leader of the Reformation, believed that usury was inevitable and should be controlled but allowed by civil law. Luther believed in the separation of civil law and Christian ethics. This view was not a result of his belief in a separation of state and religion, but because he believed the world to be too corrupt to be guided by Christianity. He viewed men as, quote, incorrigibly depraved and the world a theater of their demonic aggressions. Christian ethics and the Old Testament commandments would become the subject of utopian dreams unconnected with political or economic reality. He deemed usury a matter for the civil authorities, and thus he believed that usury may be permitted. However, Luther still considered usury a grave sin, and in his later years wrote that I quote, there is on earth no greater enemy of man after the devil than a great money and usurer, for he wants to be God over all men, and since we break on the wheel and behead highwaymen, murderers, and housebreakers, how much more ought we break on the wheel and kill, hunt down, curse, and behead all usurers? In other words, civil authority should allow usury, as in Genoa, because it was inevitable. Men will be men. But condemned in the harshest terms by the moral authority. This is the moral practical dichotomy in action, sanctioned by an extremely malevolent view of man and the universe. John Calvin, another Reformation theologian, had a more lenient view than Luther. He rejected the notion that usury is actually banned in the Bible. Since Jews are allowed to charge interest from strangers, God cannot be against usury. It is fantastic to imagine that by strangers God meant the enemies of the Jews. It is horrible and unchristian, Calvin thought, to legalize discrimination against one's enemy. According to Calvin, usury does not always conflict with God's law. So not all usury need to be damned. 
There is a grave difference between taking usury in the course of business and setting up as a usurer. If a person takes a profit on a loan on only one occasion, he's not a usurer. The crucial issue, he thought, is the motive. If the motive is to help others, usury is good. If it is profit, usury is evil. Calvin claimed that the moral status of usury should be determined by the golden rule. It should be allowed only insofar as it does not run counter to fairness and charity. Interest should never be charged to a man in urgent need or to a poor man. The welfare of the state should always be considered. In any case, a maximum rate should be set by law and should never be exceeded. Thus he concluded that interest could neither be universally condemned nor universally permitted. Now, the 16th century was not completely barren, however. Malinaus, a French jurist, made significant contributions to liberate usury from scholastic rationalism. Against the argument that money is barren, Malinaus observed that everyday experience of business life showed that the use of any considerable, considerable sum of money plus human effort yields a service of importance. He argued that money assisted by human effort does bear fruit in the form of new wealth. Just as Galileo would later apply Aristotle's method to physics and thus refute Aristotle's specific ideas in physics, Malinaus, in refuting Aristotle's argument, uses Aristotle's method. Aristotle's philosophy, with its emphasis on reality, on observation, is self-correcting. The method under, undercuts his rationalistic arguments against usury. As the economy grew and financial activity intensified, the notion that money was bound was defeated by the counter evidence in reality itself. Now there was sufficient evidence for an honest man to see it. Unfortunately, just as Galileo was to suffer for his ideas, so Molinaus suffered for his honesty and his work. The church forced him into exile, and his book was placed on a list of banned books. Nevertheless, his ideas made their way around Europe and had a significant impact on further discussion of money lending. As a result of the work of Luther, Calvin, and Molinaus, the prevailing view that emerged in the late 16th century was that money is not barren. It plays a productive role. However, usury is not Christian. It is motivated by a pure desire for profit and can be used to exploit the poor. It is useful, but not moral. Therefore, it should be controlled by the state, subjected to regulation, to protect the exploited and rein in the ability of financiers to make money. This view has influenced almost all attitudes about usury since then. In a sense, Luther and Calvin are responsible for today's so-called capitalism. They are responsible for the guilt many people feel about making money. They are responsible for the guilt that causes people to gladly regulate the functions of capitalism. They are responsible for the guilt that has destroyed capitalism over the last century. Moreover, the Protestants were the first to explicitly recognize and sanction the moral practical dichotomy. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time in areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months, starting within three bills. If cancel service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. While we know how corrupt the 16th century view is, it was considerably a, a considerable improvement over what came before. It allowed individuals who were not intimidated by Christian theology to practice money lending without legal persecution. Although limited by government constraints, the prevailing concessions allowed economic progress. Though, though far from free, financial activity flourished under its relatively loose chains. The first country to establish a legal rate of interest was England. In 1545, 
during the reign of Henry VIII. The rate was set at 10%. It is no accident that within 50 years, England was able to embark on history's first successful for-profit colonization. One of England's most significant intellectuals of the 17th century, Francis Bacon, realized the benefits money lending provided to merchants and traders by providing them with capital. He also recognized its value in providing liquidity to consumers and businesses. Although Bacon believed that the ideal would be lending at 0% interest, as the Bible required, he accepted that this was utopian and that, quote, it is better to mitigate usury by declaration than suffer to the rage by connivance. Bacon proposed two rates of interest of usury. One allowable to everyone, set at a maximum of 5%. The second rate to be, was to be higher, but only allowed to certain merchants and lent only to known individuals. The license was to be sold by the state for a fee. Again, Interest and usury were pitted against morality. But for the first time, someone acknowledged that money lending was so important that the legal rate had to offer enough incentive, a higher rate of interest, to attract enough lenders. Bacon recognized that some loans justified a higher rate of interest. In spite of this progress, artists continued to compare usurers to idle drones, spiders, and bloodsuckers. And the playwriters personified the money-grubbing users, users in such characters as Sir Giles Overreach, Mezes Mammon, Lucre, Horde, Gripe, Bloodhound. These are names of characters. Probably the greatest work of art, vilifying the user, was written during this period, The Merchant of Venice by Shakespeare which immortalized the character of the, Eve of the Jewish usurer, Shylock. In the story, Bassanio, a poor nobleman, needs cash in order to court the heiress, Portia. Bassanio goes to the Jewish moneylender, Shylock, for a loan, bringing his wealthy friend, Antonio, to stand as surety for it. Shylock, who has suffered great rudeness from Antonio in business, demands the security for the loan, not Antonio's property, which he identifies as being at risk, but a pound of Antonio's flesh. The conflict between Shylock and Antonio incorporates all the elements of the arguments against usury. Antonio the Christian lends money and demands no interest. As Shylock describes him, and I quote, How like a fawning publican he looks. I hate him, for he is a Christian. But more than that, in low simplicity, he lends out money gratis and brings down the rate of usance here with us in Venice. If I can catch him once upon the hip, I will feed him fat the ancient grudge I bear him. He hates our sacred nation, and he rails. Even there where merchants most do congregate on me, my bargains, and my well-won thrift, which he calls interest. Cursed be my tribe if I forgive him. He kind of likes Shylock. Shylock the Jew takes usury. He is portrayed as a lowly, angry, vengeful, and greedy Jew. When his daughter elopes and takes her father's money with her, he cries, O oh, daughter, O oh, ducat, O oh, my daughter, not sure for which he cares more. It is clear that Shakespeare understands the issues involved in usury. Note Shylock's legitimate hostility towards Antonio because Antonio loaned money without charging interest and thus brought down the market rate of interest in Venice. It might easily be Midas Mulligan talking about Eugene Lawson, the banker with a heart. Even Aristotle's barren money, barren money argument is present. Antonio, provoking Shylock, says, quote, If thou wilt lend this money, lend it not, as to thy friends. For when did friendship take a breed for barren metal of his friend? But lend it rather to thine enemy, who if he breaks, thou mayest with better face exact the penalty. Friends do not take breed for barren metal, in other words, offspring for money, 
Usury. Usury is something one takes from an enemy. Now it's important to note that great art has an important function in shaping popular attitudes. The depiction of Shylock, just like Dante's depiction of usurers, concretized for generations the false view of money lending and thus helped make the package deal of usury and evil and evil a part of the culture. Thus, as late as 1600, medieval morality and economics are alive and well, even if they are increasingly out of step with the economic practices of the time. Now, the European economy continued to grow throughout the Enlightenment, culminating with the Industrial Re Revolution. Increased activity in every sector of the economy contributed to this growth. Significant banking houses were established, providing credit to a wide array of economic endeavors. The Baring Brothers and the House of Rothschild were just the largest of the many banks that would ultimately help fuel the Industrial Revolution, funding industry and railroads. Understanding of the important productive role of usury continue to improve over the next 400 years, continuing the Aristotelian legacy of the Renaissance. Yet the moral evaluation of usury will change very little. Altruism in one form or another continued to hamper the acceptability of usury. In the mid-17th century, Northern Europe was home to a new generation of scholars who recognized that usury served a useful and essential economic purpose, and it should be allowed freely. Three men made significant contributions in the process. Claudius Salmasius, a French scholar teaching in Holland, thoroughly refuted the claims about the, about the barrenness of money lending, showing, showed its important productive function, and even suggested that there should be more users, since competition between them would reduce the rate of interest. Other Dutch scholars agreed with him. And Holland, partially as a result, soon became the world's commercial and financial center, the wealthiest state in Europe. Robert Jacques Turgot, an 18th century French economist, made the next significant advances. Turgot is the first to identify usury's connection to property rights. He argued that a creditor was, has the right to dispose of his money in any way he wishes, and at whatever rate the market will bear because it is his property. To go also was also the first to fully understand that the passing of time changes the value of money. He saw the difference between the present value and future value of money, concepts that are at the heart of any modern financial analysis. To go even corrected the medieval notion that time belonged to God. Time belongs to the individual who uses it, and therefore time could be sold. During the same period, Jeremy Bentham wrote a treatise entitled In Defense of Usury. Bentham argued that any restrictions on interest rates were economically harmful because they restricted an innovator's ability to raise capital. Since innovative trades inherently involved high risk, they could not be funded at high interest rates. Limits on permissible interest rates, he argued, would therefore kill innovation, the engine of growth. To re correcting another medieval error, Bentham also recognized that restrictive usury laws harmed the borrowers. Credit markets would shrink under such restrictions, but demand would not, so potential borrowers would have to seek loans in an illegal market, where they would have to pay a premium for the additional risk of illegal trading. The foundation of Bentham's argument, on usury at least, was perhaps his most important contribution, his belief in the virtues of contractual freedom. I quote, my neighbors being at liberty have happened to concur among themselves in dealing at a certain rate of interest. I who have lent, I, I who have money to lend, and Titus who wants to borrow it of me, would be glad the one of us to accept, the other to give, and interest someone higher than theirs. Why is the liberty they exercise to be made a pretense for depriving me and Titus of ours? Thus, for perhaps the first time, usury has a kind of moral defense. 
Unfortunately, Bentham and those that followed him undercut their defense of usury with their philosophy of utilitarianism. Rights, liberty, and therefore money lending were valuable only because they increased some social utility. The greatest good for the greatest number. Bentham dismissed individual rights as nonsense upon stilts and was willing to sacrifice them for the sake of the general mass of felicity in the world. He thus undercut Turgot's major achievement and by invoking altruism doomed usury's first moral defense. Following Bentham, all significant 19th century economists, Ricardo, Mill, Say, considered the issue of usury to be obvious. Interest rates should be determined fr by freely contracting individuals. These economists, followed later by the Austrians, especially uh, Menger and Bonbavik, developed sound theories of the productivity of interest and gained a significant economic understanding of its workings and its productive role. England was the country that most freely adopted these ideas and indeed owes much of its economic success in the 18th and 19th century to its relatively free financial markets and institutions. Unfortunately, English scholars never resolved the moral practical dichotomy inherent in their altruistic and social justification for usury. For example, a hundred years before Bentham, John Locke, one of the most important Enlightenment intellectuals and the father of individual rights, supported legalizing usury, I quote, borrowing money upon use it as, as equitable and lawful as receiving rent for land. But Locke also wrote, I quote, money is a barren thing and produces nothing, but by compact transfers that profit that was the reward of one man's labor into another man's pocket. Of course, this is inconsistent. If money is barren and interest is truly just a redistribution of wealth from the producer to a passive provider of capital, then how is it equitable and fair? This is an early variant of the labor theory of value. All wealth is produced by manual labor. A hundred years later, the father of economics, Adam Smith, had progressed no further in his evaluation of money lending. In its defense, he wrote, as something can everywhere be made by the use of money, something ought everywhere to be paid for the use of it. Now that's simple and elegant. However, Smith believed that the government must control the rate of interest, that unfettered markets would create excessive, excessively high interest rates. In turn, this would hurt the economy. Since he thought that society's welfare was the only justification for usury, the government must intervene to correct the errors of the invisible hand. Though Smith was a great innovator in economics, he was not in philosophy. He accepted the common philosophical ideas of his time, including altruism, and like Bentham, justified capitalism only through its social benefits. If his analysis showed a failure in the market, the government should intervene. Smith's notion of a legal interest rate was that it should be slightly higher than the market rate, what he called the golden mean. Government intervention is the logical outcome of the utilitarian defense of usury. Smith's idea of a golden mean or perfect interest rate remains with us to this day. Alan Greenspan, in today's very visible hand, <laughs> who in searching for the perfect rate alternately establishes artificially low and artificially high rates. Despite their flaws, the thinkers of the Enlightenment had created sufficient economic understanding, and philosophical understanding, to fuel the Industrial Revolution throughout the 19th century. The 19th century was Aristotle's century, the culmination of centuries of slow economic progress. Facts and reason had supplanted faith. Individualism had taken hold and the profit motive was at least acceptable. Although Enlightenment thinkers and some brilliant economists, economists had embraced Aristotle and ignited the fires of freedom and capitalism, in the preceding years, the field of philosophy was left, was left to Aristotle's enemies. As capitalism neared a glorious maturity, 
a new, more consistent brand of altruism created by Kant, Hegel, and their followers was sweeping Europe. Kant's new, more consistent altruism would find no value in money lending. And given his view of this world as unreal, usury's practical benefits would be discarded as irrelevant. The culmination of Kant's philosophy in economics is Marxism. Marx revived the medieval notion that all production was a result of manual labor. Laborers, however, did not retain the wealth they had created. The capitalists took advantage of their control over the means of production, secured to them by private property, to loot the laborer's work. According to Marx, money lending and other financial activities were not productive but exploitative. Money lenders exerted no effort, did no productive work, and yet reaped the rewards of production through usury. As a 20th century Marxist put it, the major argument against usury is that labor constitutes the true source of wealth. The dishonesty in this statement should be evident to anyone familiar with the Industrial Revolution occurring at the time. Now Marx adopted all of the medieval cliches, even the despised Jewish moneylenders. Listen to this. What is the profane basis of Judaism? Practical need, self-interest. What is the worldly cult of the Jew? Huckstering. What is his worldly god? Money. Money is the jealous god of Israel, beside which no other god may exist. Money abases all the gods of mankind and changes them into commodities. Marx believed that Jews were evil, not because of their religion, as others were claiming at the time, but because they represented self-interest. And this is, this is truly what he hated about usury and what about financiers. This evident self-interest. Grand Canyon University is Arizona's premier private Christian university, committed to providing next-generation education for students who want to make a difference in the 21st century workforce. GCU offers more than 200 academic programs in high-demand fields across nine distinct colleges. We keep our rigorous curriculum relevant by partnering with industry leaders and advisory boards. Earn your degree online, in the evening, or on our vibrant Phoenix campus. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private. Christian. Affordable. Visit gcu.edu. Now, culture in the 19th century was dominated by artists who, like Marx, resented capitalism in general, and the capitalists and, and the moneylenders in particular. Dickens, of course, gave us the immortal image of Ebenezer Scrooge. And wasn't the disgusting old lady who Raskolnikov murdered in crime and punishment a usurer? And in the Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky writes, I quote, it was known too that the young person had been given to what is called speculation, and that she had shown such marked abilities in the direction so that many people began to say that she was no better than a Jew. It was not that she lent money on interest, so not that particular sin, but it was known, for instance, that she had for some time past, in partnership with old Karamazov, actually invested in the purchase of bad debt for a trifle, a tenth of their nominal value, and afterwards had made out of them 10 times their value. In other words, she was buying junk bonds. <laughs> the great era of capitalism, of great banking houses and financial success, ended with a tide turning against usury and money lending, returning to the images of the dark ages. Marx put money lenders back into Dante's Inferno, and they have yet not been able to escape. Now, the most influential economist of the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes, while supposedly rejecting Marx, shared his hatred of the profit motive and usury. He agreed with Adam Smith that government must control interest rates, otherwise investment would suffer. On a deeper level, he revived the old Reformation idea that usury is a necessary evil. And I quote, when the accumulation of wealth is no longer of high social importance, there will be great changes in the code of morals. We shall be able to rid ourselves of many of the pseudo-moral principles which have hag-ridden us for 200 years, by which we have exalted some of the most distasteful of human qualities into the position of the highest virtues. But beware, 
The time for all this is not yet. For at least another hundred years, we must pretend to ourselves and to everyone that fair is foul and foul is fair. For foul is useful and fair is not. Avarice and usury and precaution must be our gods for a little longer still. For only they can lead us out of the tunnel of economic necessity into the daylight. Now when the Great Depression occurred in the US, it was the moneylenders on Wall Street, not surprising, who were blamed. As if the put it, we must apply social values more noble than mere monetary profit. The rulers of the exchange of mankind's goods have failed. Through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence have admitted failure and have abdicated. Practices of the unscrupulous money changes stand indicted in the court of public opinion, rejected by the hearts and minds of men. And so the so-called solution for the problems of the Great Depression was government intervention throughout the economy, but especially in the regulation of interest. In 1934, the greatest bank in American history, J.P. Morgan, was broken up into several companies. Sound familiar? After 1933, banks were restricted in all aspects of their activity. The interest rates they could pay their clients, the rates they could charge, and whom they could lend to. The system of regulation came to disastrous conclusion in the 1980s with the banking and SNL crisis. But even then, it was the bankers who were to blame. Over the centuries, usury has come to mean excessive interest. In the US, at the state level, and in most other countries, usury laws still exist that restrict the rate of interest that can be charged on personal loans. In 1913, in New York, a moneylender who issued loans to people who could not get them at conventional banks appeared before court on the charge of usury. In the judgment, the judge wrote, you are one of the most contemptible usurers in your unspeakable profession. The poor people must be protected from such shocks as you, and we must trust that your conviction and sentence will be a notice to you and all your kind and that the courts have found a way to put a stop to usury. Men of your type are a curse to the community, and the money they gain is blood money. A true medieval opinion, and no different in principle from the sentencing judge's words nearly 80 years later to Michael Milken, whose crime was dealing with junk bonds, bonds that paid a high interest, that paid usury. Payday loans are the latest form of money lending to be branded with a scarlet letter U. These loans carry annualized interest rates as high as 1,000%, since they are typically very short term to be paid back on payday, and the default rates are very high. These loans are in huge demand. Last year, $14 billion were issued to more than 8 million people. The banks issuing these loans have found ways just as banks always have, to circumvent state usury laws. A recent Wall Street Journal article examined these loans, but presented no theoretical or philosophical arguments for or against them. It did, however, tell the stories over and over again of many people whose lived, lives have been destroyed as a result of not being able to pay back the loans. Journalists today have no ideas, only emotions. A similar story in the LA Weekly last year was titled Shylock 2000. It describes horrific stories of borrowers gone bankrupt and concludes, I quote, what's astonishing about this story is that 400 years after Shakespeare created the voracious lender Shylock, such usury may be perfectly legal. What is truly astonishing is that after 400 years in which the market has proven the incredible benefits generated by money lending of all kinds. Journalists, intellectuals, and politicians still rail against usury. What is astonishing is that after all the good that bankers have given to this world, they are still being demonized. The hatred of usury is alive today at the dawn of the 21st century. Just observe the treatment offered financiers in today's movies and TV shows. The slogan, abolish usury, 
appears frequently at rallies protesting globalization, animal rights, and biotechnology. The new left and the new Christian right are committed to an anti-usury agenda. They proclaim, proclaim that, I quote, the righteous man is not a usurer, and that lending money at interest gives us the opportunity to exploit the passions or necessities of other men by compelling them to submit to ruinous conditions. Men are robbed and left destitute under the pretext of charity. And the anarchists, the so-called defenders of liberty, members of the libertarian coalition, share this view. I quote, liberty insists on the abolition of the state and the abolition of usury, on no more government of man by man, and on no more exploitation by man, of man by man. Unfortunately, this is not astonishing. Once you consider the fact that fundamentally, 20th century ethics across the spectrum are no different than those of the Middle Ages. All parties share a common ethical root, altruism. The new right gets it from the Bible, the new left from Marx, and the libertarians from anyone they feel like. <laughs> Consequently, the breach between the moral and the practical is as wide as ever. If the, if the accepted moral standard is sacrifice to society or to one's neighbor, then neither usury nor profit in general can be, can be morally justified. When reality is not the measure of truth, then the stories of ruined borrowers today have the same power over people that such stories had in the Middle Ages. The ability to ignore the benefits of usury has not changed because the Aristotelian revolution has not been completed. Although serious economists today uniformly recognize the economic benefits of charging interest or usury on loans, they rarely, if ever, attempt a philosophical or moral defense of this position. Today's economists either reject philosophy completely or adopt a moral practical split, accepting the notion that while usury is practical, it might not be moral. Modern philosophers seem to have no interest in the topic at all, partially because it requires them to deal with reality, <laughs> and partially because they know, they know that self-interest, capitalism, and everything they entail are evil. For the most part, they have long accepted Marx's position on money, and they have all accepted altruism as their moral standard. To the extent that they refer to money lending at all, they consider it axiomatically unjust. Yet no honest man can deny the benefits of money lending. By the 19th century, all the necessary evidence existed to conclude that money lending was a productive and noble activity. The wealth that capitalists and financiers had created was all around. The Austrian economists had refined the theory of the productivity of money. Property rights and their attribution to the individual had already been identified as reason that usury, at any rate acceptable to the parties, was moral. It was known that interest was a price placed on an individual's time, the individual who loaned the money. What then was missing? A philosophical revolution that explained all the known facts in moral terms. Objectivism is that revolution. Ayn Rand has provided us with a, mora with a morality where the individual's life is the standard of value, where productivity is a virtue, a requirement of life, not a social utility, and where profit is moral. Objectivism recognizes man's right over his own time and money and his right to contract freely. And Ayn Rand made the brilliant induction that the greatest productive power is the human brain, not human muscle that what exists is a pyramid of ability, not Marx's pyramid of exploitation. For hundreds of years, men suffered for the belief that worldly success in general, and money lending in particular, was practical but immoral. For the first time in history, we have a consistent philosophy in which the moral is the practical and vice versa. Objectivism sweeps away 2,000 years of philosophic corruption and injustice. We are now armed 
with the ideas that place money lenders and money lending and its practitioners, the users, the bankers, and the financiers in their proper historical place as heroes of production, as heroes who, in spite of all the persecution, played a vital role in the spectacular material progress of the West. And if you consider the wealth created by money lending when it was condemned as evil, imagine what is possible when Ayn Rand's morality finally unleashes armies of these greedy, heroic men. Thank you. Any questions? To be a money, uh, a successful money lender, it seems that you'd have to uh, practice justice uh, very scrupulously, and it occurs to me that, that might be one contributing factor to why they were uh, vilified uh, by the Christian world. I was wondering if you comment on that. Yeah, I mean, money lenders do not automatically lend money to everybody. They lend money to those individuals who they think will pay it back. Either those individuals who have real productive endeavors, real profit-making enterprises, or those uh, individuals that they view as, um, as honest, and therefore, even if they're going to use the money for consumption, will find a way to pay it back. So there have been a lot of people throughout history who have been denied money from moneylenders. And there is no doubt, for just reasons, and there is no doubt that that has played a role. You know, there's a factor of envy there, where those people who do not qualify, who do not get the money, uh, were... were envious and, and therefore persecuted them. So I think that that's absolutely right. Is that, is that what you meant by justice? Yeah, I was curious about the role of Clay and the role of Clay. You know, I, I did not find anything in my research to suggest that that, that, that actually happened. I found a lot more uh, of, of the people who had borrowed money and couldn't pay it back and their attitude towards user, uh, users. And if somebody asked me the, questions, the question about the Jews, I'll, I'll uh, elaborate on that. Thank you for a fascinating talk, Dr. Brooke. Um, I was wondering if you could explain how the opponents of money lending explained that there was such a high demand for borrowing money and why people would borrow money in the first place. Is it because the money lenders were somehow deceiving these people or these people were just short-sighted and easily tempted by immediate gains? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's mostly the second. It's that people were short-sighted they, uh, they, were, they needed the money, so they were willing to accept it on any terms. Uh, the money lender was exploiting them. And, and because these people were in desperate need, the vision, also the picture, particularly in the Middle Ages, was not of a businessman borrowing money in order to, to you know, go out and, and uh, build ships and send them across the seas and, and bring back merchandise and make money. The vision of the person borrowing the money was of the poor person who didn't have anything to eat today and therefore uh, needed some money. And instead of Christian charity, you know, instead of giving it to him, uh, they, were, they were charging interest and therefore making him even poorer in the long term. Uh, of course, that was factually incorrect. Most of the money was, was being lent by businessmen. But they just ignored that fact and created lots of loopholes to make it possible at the same time. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time and areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months, starting within three bills. If canceled service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. Hi, I'm a helpful Southern California Honda person, and recently we've been doing random acts of helpfulness, like surprising a deserving dad with a brand new grill and helping give back to our veterans. And during the Honda Summer Spectacular event, we can help you too, with a great deal on a reliable award-winning Honda, like the Accord, the 2018 North American Car of the Year. Click the dealer locator link to find a dealer near you and go to SoCalHondaDealers.com to suggest a random act of helpfulness for someone you know. Could you please comment on money lending and anti-Semitism? Thank you. 
Now, as I said, the Bible creates this, this double standard where Jews are, allow, are not allowed to lend money at your interest to other Jews, but are allowed to do so for strangers, so they can lend money to strangers. And the Christians perceive the strangers to be enemies. That is, the Jews were allowed to lend money to enemies, because, as I said, money lending was viewed as a zero-sum game, and therefore they were harming the enemy by lending the money. So imagine that you're a Christian in the Middle Ages, and you need money. And you go to the Jewish usurer and you get a loan. So A, the Jew is committing what for you would be a mortal sin. You would go to hell for this. They are charging you interest because, according to the Bible, you're their enemy. And they're making money off of it and becoming rich. So the Christian needs the Jew because they need the money, but they hate them for it at the same time. Uh, now, you know, Jews at the time were described as enriching themselves through Christian blood. Uh, and the opposition of Jewish usury was often violent. Uh, in England in 1190, the Jews of York were massacred uh, in an attack planned by members of the nobility that owed money to the Jewish moneylenders. Uh, in this and many other attacks on Jewish communities, uh, their accounting records were the first thing to be destroyed. As one eyewitness wrote, I think that at the roots of there, the Jews' disaster, with a huge infinite sums of money which barons, knights, citizens, and peasants owed them. Uh, in 1290, uh, largely as a result of antagonism generated uh, from the money lending activity, Jews were expelled from England. There, were no, there was no Jewish community in England until the 17th century. So for, uh, for five, 500 years, there were no Jews in England. So there was a lot of violence that it was a result of the fact that they were perceived as exploiting the Christians, because usually it was exploitation, as making money off of the blood of Christians. Uh, and I think that, that, together with the fact that supposedly they killed Jesus, you know, if you combine those at least early on, was, uh, was at the very root of the anti-Semitism. I, I think practically for, for the day-to-day -day Christian in the street, the fact that these guys were charging them interest was a lot more real than what happened to Jesus uh, thousands of years earlier. It's so. unusual to be surprised by libertarians, but I was surprised by your remark that uh, libertarians were opposing lending money at interest, and they seemed to tolerate, you know, permit, everything should be permitted. I'm just wondering, is this fairly widespread among libertarians now? You know, you can find every position under the world within the Libertarian Party. Uh, it's not the official position of the Libertarian Party, but it, there is definitely a segment of anarchists within there that are definitely opposed to usury, and it's, you, there's extensive use of this. And you know, I'll admit that, uh, you know, in searching, I even encountered some libertarian lists that were debating, and they were debating usury as if it was a topic open to debate, and some were for and some were against. So. I'm not surprised by anything that I read. <laughs> uh, I had a question um, in my mind. Uh, you said that the Jews weren't allowed to be in business. They weren't allowed to own property. Where did they get the money to lend anybody? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> remember that the original loans uh, starting in the, in, the, in the Dark Ages were small. They were in goods. Uh, the Jews, I think, you know, and this is probably a completely different talk, well, a lot more this worldly, even through the Dark Ages. Uh, I think that whatever business they were involved in in different places, the Jews migrated throughout Europe, by the way, as a result of these prohibitions. They kept going to the place that was going to be most liberal t to them, where they could make a little money in trade or in something else. And you didn't have to have a lot of money to, to provide usury originally. And they, they accumulated wealth slowly with, with small loans to... to in the Dark Ages, to much, much larger loans uh, later on. But, but that's a good question. I don't have a, a, a complete answer. I'm not sure what they were exactly doing in the, in the Dark Ages. Ron, I wonder if you could comment on uh, money lending at greater than legal interest rates by illegal outfits like the Mafia, where there might be a, a real economic need, let's say, of a restaurant for a loan at 75% because they can't get credit somewhere else. Is there any legitimacy to extra-legal groups like this lending money? Is there an economic value being produced? And a follow-up question, I guess, to what, to what extent can they legitimately enforce or try to collect 
Uh, they're debts. <laughs> well, I mean, this has an interesting... Absence of sure. legal legitimate protection. government legal protection. There's an interesting history here, and, and really the, the whole personal loan business that started in the United States was originally illegal. Uh, banks dealt with primarily with uh, wealthy individuals and with uh, corporations because the risk, the risks involved in, in giving uh, personal loans to individuals were high, and they could not legally charge an interest rate from those individuals. That would just, you know, given the risk, there's a you have to charge an interest rate high, to, a high interest rate to compensate for the high risk. And what happened was a whole industry was created in the early part of this century, in the U.S. of, you know, what we call loan sharks or money lenders uh, that were outside the law. And the real problem that they faced, and this had nothing to do with mafia or anything, they faced a real objective problem: how do we collect? We can't sue these people. We can't take them to court. And uh, what happened was that they relied, in a sense, on the fact that often borrowers were, were repeat borrowers, and they needed to keep, uh, to keep on good terms with these people. But the default rates were enormous. As a consequence of the default rates being enormous and the inability to collect when it defaulted, what, happened, what would happen to interest rates? They would go even higher. Right? So what you found was the fact that these, this is illegal drives the interest rates up. It makes them higher. There's no doubt that these people uh, uh, serve an economically useful function. A lot of the people who borrow money from them are, are poor people who want to open businesses. Now, true, a lot of the people who borrow from them want to go out on a night of gambling. But you know, you, you find out about these people very quickly, and they can't borrow money anymore. But the, the real bulk of the people who are borrowing money are people who are doing it for good reason, or productive people who, who are going to try and pay it back. So, you know, I'm not going to justify the tactics of the Mafia. Uh, I think the Mafia took over the business because of the collection problems. So the, the, the non-violent money lenders were charging, uh, let's say they were charging 75% interest. The Mafia could come in and charge 50% because they could collect. <laughs> so like prohibitions and other things like drugs and alcohol and so on, and gambling and prostitution, which create organized crime. Uh, because they create these economic opportunities for organized crime, the prohibition on interest throughout American history, and, I, and I'm sure to this day in some sectors, have created opportunities for organized crime to step in and take over the business. They give a better service at a lower interest rate that be, because of their ability to collect. It's interesting that even today, that these, uh, day, these payday loans are illegal in most states, and that banks are running a risk of being uh, persecuted by the states in which they operate. Now again, they found all kinds of loopholes and bankers from the beginning of time have been ingenious. And, and I, I've got example after example of the way they, they issued loans. I mean, the, the, the uh, flaunting banks in the 12th century had offices in London, in Paris, in Germany, in Jerusalem during the Crusades. I mean, these were, were international banks and they were never doing, they were never money lending at interest. They always found a way to call it something else and to pretend that it was something else other than what it really was, which was usury. Bankers have always been very creative. Uh, at doing this, in, in American history, I've given courses where I've described how American bankers got around the, the 33, 34 banking regulations and how they, they, they the, the amount of effort, the amount of intelligence, the amount of labor that has gone into finding ways around regulation is is huge and it's horrific. If you think about how, what would have happened if that, if that intelligence and labor and productivity would have gone into finding ways to legitimately increase productivity rather than having to fight, fight government regulations. So, uh, you know, even today in the Wall Street Journal, I mean, the, the states are trying to clamp down and if there's a struggle, who will step in? The mafia will step in to, to take care of these loans. Stephen. Can you comment on the practice of charging artificially low interest or zero interest on loans, the long-term effects that might not be all that obvious? There's an organization called Habitat for Humanity, which I think was founded by Jimmy Carter and a very wealthy Georgia businessman who's a fundamentalist Christian. And I think this is an organization greatly admired by right-wing conservatives because they build houses without government involvement but they lend money to people at zero interest because they say it's prohibited in the Bible to charge interest for loans. 
And other than the fact that it's going to take a lot more philanthropy to keep a group like this going, I would think for a long, are there any other, are there any consequences to a policy like that that might not be all that obvious? Well, I mean, it's a misallocation of capital. Uh, it, it, uh, the fact that they're giving it at zero, they're giving it for non-economic reasons, obviously, and therefore the money's not going to its most productive use. Uh, it, it, they're going to have high default rates, which is going to continuously, I mean, they can't make money, so they have to continuously get contributions uh, and loans. You know, if, if, if people want to do it for charity's purpose, you know, uh, I, and the people who are giving them money uh, know that it's charitable, that's fine. The problem with these organizations is they advocate this across the board. That is, uh, the Christian right advocates 0% interest across the board, and, and the most vehement attacks and usury are from the right. The most vehement, I, I, you know, I, I, their whole book, their books on Amazon, that are just attacking usury and they're all from the Christian right. They are vehemently against this. So, and I think that a lot of these charitable organizations do more than just build houses. They advocate for the kind of lending that they do. Yes, I'm wondering in your research whether you found any correlation between money lending laws and bankruptcy laws. That's a, that's a good question. I mean, I can't think of any offhand, although it sounds like they would be. And if you, if you look at, um, I mean, it's interesting that in the United States over the last, I, I'm not an expert on bankruptcy laws, but probably over the last 70 years or something, we've had this incredibly lenient bankruptcy laws, which basically say that if you file for bankruptcy, it's like the Christians, if you, you, know, if you go and confess, all sins are forgiven. Uh, if you file for bankruptcy, which is the equivalent of confession, all debts are forgiven. Uh, you know, there's no doubt what effect that has. What happens to interest rates in a case like that? Interest rates are higher in the U.S. economy because of our bankruptcy laws. There is absolutely no doubt about that. The reason uh, interest rates on credit cards are 18, 21, and if you're, you have low credit rating, uh, 25 to 28 percent, is because if you file for bankruptcy, they can't come and get your furniture. If they could get your furniture, interest rates would drop. It's the same effect of the mafia. If they could collect, then, uh, then uh, there's no doubt interest rates will lower. Well, one of the trends in history that you see, and uh, this is not related to the, bank, to the bankruptcy question, but the freer an economy is, the lower the rates of interest. Uh, and there's no doubt that the, in the US, uh, if we had more freedom, if we had less regulation, if we had more rational bankruptcy and, and a legal system, interest rates would be significantly uh, lower. Real interest rates that are charged out the market, not the ones that Alan Greenspan sets. What's your opinion of a lender who would lend actually in hopes of a default and the higher uh, profits he expects to make in terms of a uh, foreclosure on a house, for example? I have reason to believe there are such lenders and I think they're, they're going to be used as a, uh, an excuse for a further attack on lending. Now, I don't know how that works. I, I, I mean, I, because I, I think that according to the legal system, the, uh, you know, the, in foreclosure, you're only supposed to get back uh, the, the, the amount that you lent out plus what the courts decide is a reasonable rate of interest. But even if that occurred, I think that you know, it would be hard for a business like that to keep going. I think that relying on foreclosure when a lot of times when you arrive to foreclose on something, it's not there anymore, or it's not in the shape you expected it to be, is a very risky business. So I just don't think it's economically viable. Uh, there's no doubt that the, uh, the, you know, the Shylocks of the world, and you know, they are, you know, Shylock asks for a pound of flesh because he wants Antonio's life. He hates him and he wants to kill him. Uh, there are people like that, and, and they are used as the example, and in, in the kind of world we live in where people are guided by emotions rather than by facts and reason, that has a huge impact. And that's why a Wall Street Journal article doesn't have to give a, 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 an argument against you. It just gives examples. It just gives stories. Uh, could you comment further on the relationship between altruism and the views of lending. Uh, I see the lenders are generally pictured as the haves and the borrowers as the have-nots. Yeah, I mean, that's partially an issue of, of, of the zero-sum world. The, 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 uh, the money lenders are making money, are growing in wealth as the borrowers are declining in wealth, are losing money. So it's obvious that they are doing it for profit and for personal gain. 
I also think that the, the, uh, the financiers in general, and this is not limited to money lenders, you know, they have a hard time explaining what it is that they do in the productivity. I mean, Bill Gates can pretend to be an altruist. He can come out there and, well, I mean, he, he philosophically he is, but he can, he can actually come out and say, you know, Microsoft is good for the world. All of you use this piece of software. I don't, I'm not just trying to make money, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to be nice to you. And even then, he's persecuted and condemned. What do the financiers bring out? I mean, it's not what the financiers, what the money lenders do is not perceptual. It's conceptual, it requires uh, explanation. We make Microsoft software possible. Now that's a difficult argument. It's an argument that has been made and can be made and easily made if you accept reason. But they, they can't hide, as I think businessmen do today, behind a product. So they are more explicitly and obviously selfish. They are making money. That's what they go. When, when you ask a trade on Wall Street, what are you doing today? I'm making money. All he does is you know, deal with money. He's not dealing. You ask a, a businessman in manufacturing, I'm making a product. So it seems like there's some benefit to humanity he's providing. He can hide behind that. So I think that financiers in general perceive this, um, uh, you know, as it's easy to perceive them as selfish versus, uh, versus the, uh, uh, the manufacturers. I think they should be proud of that and exalt in that and announce to the world that, that uh, they are selfish. But of course, they are, have been and will be persecuted for that fact. I think we're out of time. So thank you. All material in this program is protected by copyright and may not be reproduced in any form or manner, nor played before a live audience, without the express written permission of the producer, the Ayn Rand Institute. For further information, or to order other products, please visit eStore.AynRand.org or call one 800 Seven two nine six one four nine. Welcome to the Total Wireless Store, where total confidence awaits. Our daughter's off to summer camp, and we're worried our network coverage won't reach her. Don't worry. You got this with Total Wireless. Our phones run on the nation's best 4G LTE network. It'll be like she never left. The nation's best network? I feel better already. Now you can focus on how you're spending your summer. Discover the Total Wireless stores and get total confidence. The latest phones, the best network, all at great prices. Now open in Los Angeles. Refer to the latest terms and conditions of service at TotalWireless.com. You can't print invoices without ink. You can't print status reports, spreadsheets, or that report due in 12 minutes without ink. No, you can't print anything without ink. Luckily, Staples has a huge selection of ink and toner in stock and at great prices every day. This week only, buy one HP ink at Staples and get a second 30% off. So stock up now because you can't afford to run out of ink. And Saturday, 721-18. See store associate or staples.com for details. Restrictions may apply. 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 For details. Restrictions.